the body of God, major themes in the Sur of the Temple. Uh, the body of God may sound like a pretentious uh, title, uh, and perhaps it is, but uh, by the end of the presentation, I hope you get the sense of what I mean by this symbolic uh, statement. Obviously, one of them is the, the idea of the temple itself, which as Baha'u'llah explains in this work, relates to his personification uh, of the attributes and powers of God. Uh, we begin with, uh, as really every discussion of Baha'i theology and ontology does, with the Hadith of the Hidden Treasure. Uh, the entirety of creation and all relationships among every created thing derive from the single but encompassing desire of the Creator to be known and loved, not for his own ratification, but to share his bounties with a being capable of freely choosing to participate in that endlessly joyful and bene beneficent and beneficial relationship. Until one understands this verity that constitutes the rationale underlying creation and progressive revelation, and then all other knowledge and understanding uh, is of minimal value. Uh, I'm not going to get into that a lot in this presentation, but um, it's a very important thing to understand. That until you understand the rationale for creation, God's rationale for creating, you can't really appreciate how everything else works to contribute to that enterprise. Uh, so we have first to begin with this very important statement, not from the Siri Haeckel, but from a letter the Guardian wrote in 1947 but it's very profound bearing on what we're about to discuss. We will have experience of God's spirit through his prophets in the next world, but God is too great for us to know without this intermediary. The prophets know God, but how is more than our human minds can grasp. We believe we may attain in the next world to seeing the prophets. There is certainly a future life, heaven and hell are conditions within our own beings. So the importance of this is that the prophets are not only the most uh, perfect representation of God and godliness uh, in this life, but even in the next life. So that's very important for us to then understand and appreciate exactly who and what they are. Well, the Suri Haeckel is an allegory, and that is it's the rest of what took place in the uh, conversation between the maid of heaven that appears as an apparition before Baha'u'llah in this dream vision he has in the Sia Chao. So she doesn't literally exist. And as Tahirzadeh says in his discussion of this work, it's interesting that really what you have in this work is a conversation between uh, Baha'u'llah and himself in one sense. In another sense, it's similar to the idea of what we go through when we reflect on something or meditate on something. As Abdul Baha says, it's uh, a conversation between our self, our rational self, and our spirit. The main narrator, the maid of heaven, is the Holy Spirit operating through the personage or the persona, if you want to use a literary term, of Baha'u'llah. The voice of Baha'u'llah, of course, is, it's distinguished in the work who's speaking and, and, and so on. And the, the, the whole discourse is dominated by the maid of heaven speaking to Baha'u'llah. The voice of Baha'u'llah is the persona or character of the manifestation seeking assistance and guidance. The five world leaders that are included in the final version of the Suri Haikal, and this is the version that was uh, finished by Baha'u'llah uh, in Akko, where he had it uh, put into the form of a haikal or a five-pointed star that represents the human body. Uh, for symbolic reasons, we'll get to in a second. So in, he includes within that work five world leaders, uh, the letters he had written to five world leaders, and it's not tacked on, it's right in the central part of the work. The peoples of the world are ultimately the recipients of both the guidance, the mandate, and the access to God. So in one sense, 
this is a uh, description of how power and guidance is generated by God through the manifestations, first to those who are in charge of guiding humankind at the uh, secular level uh, in, by the manifestations, and finally to the populace as a whole, since as Baha'is we believe we all are on the same journey to attain the presence of God through the manifestations, but also because ultimately uh, in the Baha'i concept of universal suffrage, we all are participants in constructing the edifice of secular governance. So who are the five re representative recipients that Baha'u'llah chose to include? Well, the Pope, the head of Christendom, Napoleon III, who at the time of this writing was, this was the second letter that Baha'u'llah sent to him, was one of the most noteworthy the powers in Europe, though only a few years after this letter was composed, he was defeated at Sedan and he escaped to England and deceased there. So he lost his power as predicted by Baha'u'llah. Tsar, uh, Tsar Alexander II of Russia, Queen Victoria, and the Shah, um, uh, Nasir din Shah, the monarch of Shia Islam, or the monarch really of, of, uh, of Persia, but of course, uh, sort of a titular head of Shia Islam as well. So there is this dramatic narrative taking place in the Sia Chao, and Baha'u'llah describes this in the Suri Heiko. He says, pointing with her finger into my head, she addressed all who are in heaven and all who are on earth, saying, by God, this is the best beloved of the worlds, and yet you comprehend it not. This is the beauty of God amongst you and the power of his sovereignty within you, could ye but understand. This is the mystery of God and his treasure, the cause of God and glory is glory unto all who are in the kingdoms of revelation and of creation, if you be of them that perceive. This is he whose presence is the ardent desire of the denizens of the realm of eternity and of them that dwell within the tabernacle of glory. And yet from his beauty ye doth turn aside. So you have again this uh, uh, allegorical presentation of the Holy Spirit. And of course, these are the words of Baha'u'llah. He has created them, but he has decided to devise this allegory so you can get the sense of how the Holy Spirit even though working through him uh, and the best access we have to it is not dependent on him. In other words, you have all of the other manifestations. It is an emanation from God. And so the Haeckel is rep represents the pentacle, the five-pointed star, which itself, of course, throughout history of literature and, and, uh, and religion has many symbolic meanings. Uh, but it is explicitly in the context of this work representing the human body, as I've taken this particular work from uh, history from 1533 to demonstrate that. Uh, here is another demonstration of what the Suri Haeckel might have looked like. We do not have the original, unfortunately, but the Bob uh, used the same device, this artistic representation of how he is addressing humankind by this calligraphic, uh, beautiful calligraphy uh, in the form of a pentacle, in the same way we can imagine that the Suri Haeckel was. So uh, in my own discussion of the Suri Haeckel, uh, I discuss at least six levels of symbolic meaning of what the Haeckel itself means. Uh, the first is, as we just saw, the human body, the means by which our soul associates with physical reality and learns about and prepares us for the birth, our birth into the divine realm, therefore a means by which we first gain access to God. For this reason, our bodies after death are, according to Baha'i law, treated with respect. The body, though now dust, was once ex uh, exalted by the immortal soul of man. So that's the first level of meaning, the very obvious, sort of the lowest level. It represents the human body. The temple is a place of worship. Of course, this is a very literal use of the word temple. 
uh, such as the Baha'i houses of worship, uh, of worship uh, where we enter to attain the presence of God in a sacred place. And of course, the Baha'i, the, the design for Baha'i temples have in common the nine equal entrances, all culminating in a central dome, meaning that regardless of through what path or religion you enter the presence of God, all of our prayers and all of our desire to attain spirituality are through connection with the same being, the same God. The temple, as alluding to the third rebuilding of the Temple of Solomon, as foretold in uh, Shoghi Effendi, uh, uh, as foretold in the scripture, and uh, Shoghi Effendi alludes to this regarding the rebuilding of the temple, ostensibly alluding to the third temple, as actually a reference to the advent of Baha'u'llah, as opposed to an allusion to an actual third building, temple building to be constructed after the second uh, temple was destroyed in 70 AD or the common era by the, the Roman siege of Jerusalem. Um, then a fourth level of interpretation, the temple as the physical appearance of the manifestation, which is our means of gaining proximity to God. And here's a quote, probably the most famous quote from the Surrey Haeckel, and it sort of sums up in one sense, the whole uh, idea of the station of the manifestation as our access to God, both in this realm and the realm to come, as we just read. Not as seen in my temple, but the temple of God, and in my beauty, but his beauty, and in my being, but his being, and in myself, but his self, and in my movement, but his movement, and in my acquiescence, but his acquiescence, and in my pen, but his pen, the mighty, the all praise. There, uh, there hath not been in my soul, but the truth, and in myself naught could be seen, but God. Very powerful statement. And it relates very uh, importantly to uh, another passage that I'm not gonna read right now, but where uh, the, um, where Baha'u'llah says that the um, uh, divine unity is attaining the state of divine unity is achieved when we accept everything the prophet does and says as equivalent to being the word of God and the guidance of God. Then the, a fifth level of symbology. The word hekel or temple is composed in Arabic of four letters. Now this is right from the work itself. Uh, the, these symbols are explained in the work of ha, ya, kaf, and lam. Uh, the first letter is taken to symbolize the word huvia, the essence of divinity. The second word karir, or almighty, of which ya is the third letter. Its third letter, the word karin, or all bountiful and its fourth letter, the word fazal, or grace, of which lam is the third letter. And this is from note three, 237 of summons of the Lord of hosts, and in particular, the work, the Suri Heiko. And then finally, the sixth level of, of symbolism, the universe as, and this is my own idea, and this, this is sort of getting at why I chose to title the work, The Body of God. The universe as the totality of physical reality is on a symbolic level, the most expansive expression of the body of God. Therefore, physical reality created according to the Hadith of the hidden treasure as a means by which the creator could make himself known. And so in other words, if you think about it, uh, it's not just one planet would suffice to bring about the fruition of the wish of God but rather the entire entirety of creation thus become sort of the physical aspect of the divine creation of God. And the spiritual aspect, of course, uh, is a counterpart of that. So together they form the sort of body of God, not literally, uh, uh, God is autonomous, self-sufficient and independent of his creation. So what are the main themes of the work? Well, of course, this, these symbols are one, but uh, the prophet represents then the an incarnation, perfect incarnation of all the attributes of God, 
through his utterances, through his actions. And then the delegation of authority is a second theme that I think is extremely important. Uh, and that I've already mentioned, first God delegates authority to the level of command of the prophet uh, as the intermediary between God and creation. And then from the prophet to human governance, as is represented in this work by the letters of, of Baha'u'llah to the five rulers, to the peoples of the world ultimately, because not only in these letters does he address and allude to the peoples of the world who are also obliged to follow his guidance. But as I said, because the governance designed by Baha'u'llah includes universal suffrage so that the peoples of the world are responsible for being the pillars upholding this whole process. Uh, another theme is justice manifest at every level of society. This is a repeated theme in every letter to all five rulers and in the work itself. Justice, justice, and of course, in particular, he's concerned with justice of the rulers to those uh, who under their, are under their charge and seek from them not but, uh, but justice, sufficiency, and so on. Uh, this was much discussed at that time because you have the decline and ultimate eradication of all of these empires represented by these five uh, secular and religious rulers. So what does justice mean? It means a global polity and collective security. And this, of course, are the ingredients for the most great peace uh, are, and the lesser peace as well. Uh, so he charges them in uh, every letter, charges each of them to come together and create this pact, this global security. Universal suffrage, the, uh, he praises particularly Queen uh, Victoria because she relies on the elected parliament to advise her. The inalienable rights of humankind. And while he doesn't go into all of them, they are implicit in these letters that people have a right to freedom and to the necessities of life. Then another theme is the rejection of the most great peace, something he says explicitly in the letter to Queen Victoria. Uh, he says, now that you have rejected the most great peace, at least try to seize the lesser peace as best you can. Uh, and what is clear as he speaks is they have rejected it by rejecting him, that even if they at this point come together to form this pact, and construct a, a, a collective security, they have still to recognize Baha'u'llah as the manifestation for this age, to heed his advice, and thereby accept the lesser peace. Uh, they have already foregone the gr most great peace in their responses to Baha'u'llah, in which they, the most benign of which, of course, is Queen Victoria's statement, where she says that if it be of God, it will endure, uh, and uh, of course it, it did endure, but she didn't accept Baha'u'llah, even though of course Queen Marie of Romania did. Uh, so accept the lesser peace by gathering to consult, constructing the pact and disarm to the extent possible. And of course this is made more clear in the, uh, or clearer in the Kitab Agdas. And it's also in these letters that they should retain only those armaments necessary to maintain civil peace. So here are the individuals in picture, the Pope Pius, notice the death dates on all of them are about the same, the end of the 1870s, except for Queen Victoria. Uh, so you've got Pope Pius, uh, the Pope, uh, in the letter of the Pope, he emphasizes that this is the second coming that the pontiff himself should get rid of his pomp and circumstance and ceremony and all his riches, give them to the poor, follow the example of Christ. Let deeds be thy adorning, he says. Don't repeat what the Pharisees did to Christ by rejecting him and by uh, proceeding to retain their own beliefs to Christians uh, and the people of other religions. So he, in each of the letters, he talks not only to the individual recipient, 
but to the people over whom they hold sway. The effect of the Pope's rejection of Baha'u'llah, that's very powerful, needless to say. And again, this is in line with the same thing of the Pharisees rejecting Christ. And so that parallel should have uh, had some weight with the Pope, but of course it did not. In fact, shortly after receiving that letter, he instituted the uh, infallibility of the papacy. Uh, Napoleon III, again, death date 73, uh, shortly after he received this letter, which would have been in about 69 uh, or 70, uh, when the Surrey Haeckel was completed, to the Pope. Uh, he has to the Pope and to Alexander both these very explicit proofs of who he is that should really have awakened them. Uh, and I'm sure in the afterlife, it, it made them have many regrets. And he says, we heard what you said uh, about the voices you heard of the people dying in the sea, of, in, the, in the Black Sea. And that's why you waged war in the Crimean War. He says, that's, that's not what, the reason you had it all. It was for your own prestige and gain. But the fact that he repeats to him words that he said in private, would certainly uh, cause anyone uh, uh, of normal sensibilities to take heed. O King, we heard the word thou didst utter in answer to the Tsar of Russia concerning the decision made regarding the war. Thy Lord verily knoweth and is informed of all. Again, he emphasizes as he does, does with all of these, uh, the Christian uh, uh, rulers he's writing, that he is the return of Christ, and then he urges Napoleon to heed the obligations he has as a ruler, namely of being just to his subjects and the guidance for this day to the peoples of the world of France and the world as a whole. Uh, and final advice to the emperor, which is a personal thing, and that is sort of similar to what he says to Mirza Yahya and the Agdas, there's still hope for you individually. All you have to do is turn to God, plead for his forgiveness, and accede to my guidance. Perhaps he did, who knows? If not, maybe he has by, by this point in his progress in the, in the afterlife. Tsar Alexander II, again, death date, 1881. Uh, the themes in his letter, the propitious position of the czar and what he has to do in so far as getting rid of what was essentially a, the uh, maintaining of a feudal society, uh, which of course was what brought about ultimately the Bolshevik revolution in 1917, uh, appeals to him as a Christian ruler, again, the return of Christ. And then the inescapable proof, we heard what you prayed for, and here is the prayer. We heard, we verily have heard the thing for which thou didst supplicate thy Lord, while secretly communing with him. Wherefore the breeze of my loving kindness wafted forth, and the sea of my mercy surged, and we answered thee in truth. Thy Lord verily is the all-knowing, the all-wise. So again, this should have just shocked the, the czar to know in that here is a strange prisoner writing to him from a foreign land <laughs> saying, I know what you prayed about and we answered the prayer. The most great peace, again, he uh, exhorts him to uh, achieve that. Uh, and of course, by the time he received this, it was a fait accompli, the most great peace had been rejected. The station of the monarch who recognizes Baha'u'llah. This is something very powerful. And, and he says this in other places as well. And that is, you think you have power now. If you accept me, this revelation, your renown will be unparalleled in the annals of human history on planet Earth. And of course, that's true. And of course, Queen Marie of Romania will outshine in retrospect of history, all of these rulers together. Queen Victoria, of course, was the most benign responder, and she had a government which was, as Baha'u'llah points out in his letter, the fact that he uh, applauds her use of the parliament, 
uh, applauds her abolition of slavery. Uh, but then uh, after a few kind words, he suddenly shifts the tone of the letter and starts talking about governance in general, uh, Baha'u'llah's specific admonition to the rulers of, as a whole, uh, and uh, then finally talks about now that you, and again, talking to the rulers as a whole, not the Queen Victoria herself. And that's what I'm saying, only the first part is to her, and then he sort of shifts and uses it as a vehicle to talk to everyone. So he says, that now that this is where he explicitly states, now you have rejected the most great peace, at least do what you can to accept the lesser peace. Then finally, the most lengthy letter, in fact, it's longer than all the other letters put together, is the letter to Nasir Din Shah. Again, death date 96. So he outlives some of them, but uh, dies uh, on his uh, the celebration of his most lengthy of uh, reigns. Uh, only to be assassinated before that could occur. So to the Shah, and of course, you're probably familiar with this le uh, letter uh, insofar as this is where he talks about, uh, rehearses of what happened in the Sea of Chang. This is where he says, I was a, uh, uh, like a man, uh, like others, asleep upon my couch. And we're gonna look at that in a second. So the themes in this letter are the delegation of authority, the attendant theme of justice, judge us fairly. He talks a great deal about, of course, the fact that the Shah was the main instigator of the uh, uh, programs, if you will, uh, uh, the uh, uh, killing of the Babis uh, and, and later of the Baha'is. And yet, strangely, the tone of this letter is kinder and more gentle uh, than the letters to the other rulers. That's something to think about. And that is, he is not belligerent. He is not seeking vengeance. He does not, in effect, throw in his face the, the, of the Shah all of the evil he has done, even though he says, you know, you rule over people of all religions, all of them should have uh, have justice and the ability to worship, and yet look how you treat us. So he does bring it up, uh, but but not in the way you might think he would. So he again brings up this is a new revelation from God, and this is where he brings up the uh, the fact that uh, how he uh, the first intimations of his revelation in the Sea of Chal, of course. The Shah, if you remember, put him there at the insistence of, of his mother. The Shah's mother was a big prime mover behind the Shah's attitude towards the Baha'is. And of course, you, you remember the story that uh, the uh, Shah could hear the voices of the uh, prayers of the Babis singing, uh, singing or chanting their prayers together in the Sea of Chang. So he parallels the treatment of himself, Baha'u'llah's treatment, to that of the fourth Imam. The, uh, so uh, to um, uh, Hussein, whose, whose head was severed and so forth, and a uh, very dramatic, very important figure in Shia Islam in the history, and of course, the reason for uh, Baha'u'llah's name being Hussein Ali, Mirza Hussein Ali. The urgency of the moment, the fact that now is the time to act if you're going to act. And it's going to go by very quickly. So in other words, that here's a window opportunity that you have that will never occur again. And here's a passage from that letter, most famous probably among all of the passages and so far as the intimations of his uh, revelation in the CHR. Oh, King, I was but a man like others asleep upon my couch. When lo, the breezes of the all glorious were wafted over me and taught me the knowledge of all that hath been. This thing is not for me, but for one who is almighty and all knowing. And he bade me lift up my voice between earth and heaven. And for this there befell me what hath caused the tears of every man of understanding to flow. And so was he a man like others asleep upon his couch? And this is something that's been sort of a hobby horse of mine and so far as uh, 
something I like to point out wherever possible because it's so widely misunderstood. He doesn't become a manifestation, none of them do. They pre-exist in the world of the spirit, unlike us. And the point of, of uh, epiphany, our first intimations, are just that, as, as Shoghi Effendi points out. Uh, and Abu Baha points it out even more emphatically, and I'm going to read to you. Uh, uh, and this is again the same the same passage. I was a man like others, asleep upon my couch. Well, of course there were no couches, so he's not talking literally. Uh, he is talking about a dream vision. I was like a man asleep upon a couch. Uh, so Abu Baha explains this authoritatively in the following way. So listen carefully because it's a very uh, important uh, axiom about the ontology of the manifestations. Abu Baha then explains the metaphorical meaning of the state of being asleep in this passage in three different ways. For example, sleeping is the state of repose and wakefulness is the state of motion. Sleeping is the state of silence and wakefulness is the state of utterance. Sleeping is the state of concealment and wakefulness is the state of manifestation. Briefly, and this is a continuation of the same passage, the manifestations of God have ever been and will ever be luminous realities and no change or alteration takes place in their essence. At most, before their revelation, they are still and silent like one who is asleep and after their revelation, they are eloquent and effulgent like one who is awake. Once and for all then, the very themes and cautions so eloquently and powerfully set forth in the Surihiko have now become fully apparent that the body of mankind on planet earth must like the temple of the manifestation himself be constructed from the ground up. And this is uh, my own statement of the conclusion of the whole thing, and that is within the work, the voice of the maiden constructs the temple bit by bit, feet, eyes, ears, tongues, breasts, and the inmost heart. And so what I'm saying here in the conclusion, both here and in my own book, is that we too are exhorted in this work to have this same capacity with feet of iron to stand firm and demonstrate such constancy as to cause the feet of every severed soul to be strengthened in the path of God. And you see the paragraph numbers if you want to turn to these quotes. Eyes that will contemplate the manifold signs of their creator. Ears that will hearken to the melodies of your Lord tongues that will praise and extol me amongst the concourse of eternity, breast cleansed so that the light of my beauty may appear therein, and inmost hearts which become the dawning place of our knowledge and the dayspring of our wisdom unto all who are in heaven and earth.